I was really appreciate the invitation to talk to Stanford alums. When you went to Stanford, I was almost certainly here. I've been here since July of 1973. And so uh, I think that indicates uh, that I'm uh, pretty much a Stanford guy uh, now. Uh, let me take you back to your days in the classroom in the sense I'm gonna share slides. Uh, so let me do that now. Uh, the talk is uh, planning for retirement and uh, it's also involving saving uh, for the future. Uh, so a little bit about investments, but largely the biggest reason people save is for retirement. It's a big need, and uh, I want to go over uh, just some of those uh, facts. So uh, one question I have is, uh, you might be surprised if you're talking about retirement and saving, uh, why I would start off with how long might you live. But uh, it is important because you have to have money uh, to last you for the rest of your life. And probably many of you are going to live longer than you think. So let me give you, uh, first of all, I'll tell you again why that's relevant. It's relevant because how long you live uh, determines how long you have to finance consumption without labor income. Uh, and um, so that's a first order problem, uh, first part of the problem is how many years do you have to cover uh, with your money? So let's consider somebody, this may or may not describe you, but say there's somebody, a 50-year-old uh, woman today uh, who's married to a 52-year-old man. Who knows, maybe they're both Stanford graduates and uh, they plan to retire in uh, 12 years at age uh, 62 and 64. By the way, that is, actually among the most common ages of retirement, 62 for women and 64 for men. So the question is, how long uh, might uh, they live in retirement? After they retire, how much longer will they live? Well, let me give you some statistics from the Social Security Administration who thinks about this a lot. Uh, and by the way, somebody who's 50 uh, today uh, they won't be uh, 90 uh, in 12, until the 2060s. So they have to forecast what the health system and so forth will be like. But what they think is that at least one of those two people uh, will live for 30 more years after retirement. They give about a 46% chance that one of them will be alive. Uh, the woman at that point uh, would be a 92 and the man would be 94. And there's a, about a 50-50 chance that one of them will be alive. So that means that you need to be prepared for that eventuality, basically have enough money uh, to last for uh, at least 30 years of retirement. By the way, even 35 years of retirement, um, there's about a 20% chance that one of these two people will be alive. 30 five years after they retired at 62 and 64. And yes, you're right. That means that the woman would be 97. Uh, and by the way, it's overwhelmingly likely that she would be uh, the survivor. But 35 years is a long time to finance it yourself uh, without labor income. So now I, I wanted to know uh, how long could they have worked? And uh, well, you're retiring at 62 and 64. At most, you could have worked about 35 years. I'm sorry, about 40 years. And uh, so I guess in my mind, it's, um, uh, it's really difficult, nearly impossible to finance a 30-year retirement with a 40-year career. Uh, yeah, you know, you'd have to think about it. What would you do? Uh, save three-sevenths of your money? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's very difficult to do. This is difficult to do if the government is financing that 30-year retirement or if you individually are financing it. It's a long time. So in the long run, I think uh, financially secure retirements are going to require people uh, to work uh, longer. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, 
why are interest rates so incredibly uh, low? And uh, you may not think that they are that low, but they are the lowest that I've seen in my lifetime. Now, one thing that we all have to be aware of today is inflation. Inflation hasn't really been a subject since the late uh, 70s or early 80s, but it's back. Uh, and uh, so you need to distinguish between the real interest rate and uh, the nominal interest rate. The real interest rate is the nominal rate minus the rate of inflation. So for instance, say you have money in a bank account. Well, today, most banks are paying what's called one basis point, which for those of you who don't talk in basis points, that's one hundredth of 1%, 0.01%. In other words, they're paying you almost nothing. Now, in the last 12 months, inflation in the US has been 7.9%. That's the official estimate, almost 8%. So you're getting nothing and you're losing 8%, 7.9%. The real interest rate is minus 7.89%. I'm not sure it's been this low uh, in, uh, you know, in, in some of your lifetimes, but it's incredibly uh, low. Uh, you're losing money on your bank account and I'm, probably that's not news to you. Now the safest asset around are treasury inflation protected securities. They're called TIPS and they're offered by the US government. They're US government bonds, but they do adjust uh, for inflation. So they're kind of good. Uh, so let me tell you what uh, real yields are uh, today on these TIPS. So I have some quotes from just last week on what the government was offering at different maturities on these inflation protected bonds, which I'm arguing are the safest assets you can get. Uh, well, look at those negative signs. At all maturities, the real interest rate is negative. If you uh, buy a five-year treasury inflation protected securities, your return is going to be minus 0.58%. If you do it for 10 years, it's essentially minus 1%, 0.99%. And even if you do it for 30 years, the government's offering negative uh, 0.23%. Uh, so uh, get used to those negative signs. Real interest rates are negative. Inflation adjusted interest rates are negative. At every maturity, the real interest rate on tips is negative. By the way, when they were introduced, which was 1997, the 10 year was offering not negative, but positive three and a half percent, three and a half percent plus inflation adjustments. So that was an attractive investment, but today it's minus 1% at the uh, 10 year maturity. So let's just make sure you understand if you have $1,000 and you buy a 10 year tip, what are you going to get back in uh, 10 years? Well, you're going to get back about $900. In other words, you're losing uh, money. Uh, by the way, you would almost certainly buy them through a mutual fund, and they're going to charge you uh, as well. Uh, there's also going to be some taxes to pay, but you're losing money. You, you put in 1000 and you 10 years later, you take out $900 inflation adjusted. So interest rates are incredibly low. Yeah, and you've all heard the uh, expression, the power of compound interest. Supposedly Einstein said it was the eighth wonder of the world. Well, guess what? There is no power of compound interest when interest rates are negative. So um, it's a new world uh, and certainly saving and demanding safety uh, right now is, you know, it's pretty unattractive or at least it, the returns are very, very low. Now, uh, let's, uh, uh, let me just show you uh, in my class, this personal finance class that Tanya mentioned, I'm teaching it with Michael Boskin. And what we do as we teach, uh, we will um, show real-time polls on the screen and the students will answer to see whether they've got the concepts. 
For instance, I might ask them if inflation is five and a half percent and uh, the interest rate is three percent, what's the real interest rate? And they'll take out their phones, they'll answer the question, and this bar graph will appear on this page, and we'll see if they get it right. Uh, the right answer, by the way, is minus two and a half percent, but I put down eight and a half percent just in case somebody added the two numbers in the question. Uh, and then I put down plus two and a half percent just because if the people didn't get the minus sign. But the answer is minus uh, two and a half percent. I'm putting this here basically to tell you in the classroom today, there is interaction between the students and the professor and these polls are the way we're doing it. Now, uh, there are some results of these uh, negative interest rates. One is that uh, uh, bonds seem very unattractive to me. Uh, you know, regular non-TIPS uh, US government bonds at the 10-year maturity are offering about 2.1%. By the way, I had to change this slide today uh, because the 10-year uh, rate has gone up to 2.1%. Uh, just last week, it was 1.8%. So these rates do move around. But my question is, does anyone think that the inflation rate over the next 10 years will be at or less than 2.1%? And I think most of you would say, no, you're now beginning to realize inflation is going to be above 2.1%. In other words, if you buy one of these bonds, you're getting negative real interest rates. Um, these poor interest rates, low interest rates, negative interest rates have been around now for quite a while. They're more extreme now than they were even a year ago or two years ago. But negative or zero interest rates have real rates have been around uh, since 2009. And this has led to a search for better returns. People are not happy with 0%. Uh, so uh, I think this in turn has uh, really uh, increased the demand for stocks um, and caused the stock market to have an incredible run over the 20, uh, 2009 to 2021 period. You may not think uh, the stocks are doing so great uh, this week or this month, uh, but stocks have had an incredible run over the uh, last 12 years and or 13 years. And I think that's largely because uh, it's a search for yield. And uh, so the expression that, uh, that I think describes why people are buying equities and stocks and mutual funds, it's because of TINA. And TINA stands for there is no alternative. Uh, so that's uh, uh, one effect of the low interest rates. Now, uh, I was now going to talk a little bit about Social Security. And for most uh, Americans, their most valuable asset when they retire is the present value of their future Social Security. And you may not know, because you're probably not amongst them, but about half of the people who retire they have no financial wealth. They are dependent on Social Security. And, um, but the, some do have financial wealth. And then the question is, how should you use your financial wealth and how should you uh, use your Social Security? Um, now, Social Security has a lot of uh, attractiveness to it. The retirement benefits are paid out as an inflation index life annuity. Uh, and that's a really valuable form. A life annuity means the payments last for your life. Uh, the payments actually may even go to your surviving spouse if you die first. Inflation adjusted, there aren't many annuities like that. But it's a great uh, form of payment. And uh, for those with low income, Social Security can replace 75%, sometimes even more and for the very low, say you're a minimum wage person, it might uh, give you a 90% replacement rate. So it really helps you in retirement. Um, if you're a middle income person, and I literally mean around the med median, uh, then uh, Social Security is gonna replace about 40 to 50% of your wages. And uh, if you're a high income or, uh, and for most Stanford grads, you probably are in the high income category, then Social Security is somewhat less important and it has a lower uh, replacement rate. 
But I did want to uh, think about uh, and mention there is one exception to the fact that safe interest rates are low or safe returns are low. There's an exception as one that you might want to even know about. So when you do retire, you actually have two decisions. One is when to retire. And the other is, when should I start my Social Security? You are allowed to start your Social Security, not when you retire, but after you retire. And if you do that, you will get uh, larger benefits, quite a bit larger. Delaying the start of Social Security uh, um, earns it earns a very high rate of return, um, very high, not the negative ones we were just looking at. So let's say you retire at 62, lots of people do, but you don't start your Social Security until uh, 70. When you do start your Social Security, your monthly benefits are not going to be what they were at 60, would have been at 62. They're going to be a fairly whopping 77% higher. And this is without inflation. You also get inflation adjustment for those eight years. Uh, so it easily could be that you're getting double what you would have gotten at uh, 62. So uh, how can you take advantage of the great payment for delaying Social Security? Well, let's say you retire before 70. Uh, you have some assets, financial assets, like maybe a 401k account. Uh, and what you should do is take that out first, live on that, and delay your Social Security. Uh, don't start your Social Security right away. Uh, it, delaying Social Security uh, offers about a 6% per year real rate of return. Uh, and so that's far higher than any safe asset. And certainly in questions, we can talk about whether Social Security is safe. Uh, I would think for current retirees or people of retirement age, it is safe. Uh, but uh, I think delaying Social Security is really one of the best deals in town. Uh, and so I would advise that you manage your Social Security by delaying the commencement of benefits uh, if you are in good health. Obviously, you wouldn't want to do that if you're in bad health uh, at the time uh, you retire. Okay. So let's go on to another uh, uh, topic, namely uh, target date funds. A very popular investment uh, for retirement saving is, is target date uh, funds. And uh, uh, you may or may not know about them, but if you join uh, an employer at age, let's say 32, uh, it's quite likely that if you don't tell them how to invest your 401k account, they will put you into, uh, if you're 32, they may put you into a 2055 fund, a 2055 target date fund. 2055 is uh, when you would turn 65. So it's age adjusted. They would offer 2050 funds, 2045 funds, 2040s, 2035, even 2025, the whole array. And you'd be put in the one which, uh, where you would be turning about 65. And what happens in these funds is the asset allocation, that is the stocks versus bonds, it gradually changes as you reach and approach uh, the target date. Initially, uh, they're mostly in stocks when you're young, but as you approach your target date, they gradually move into bonds. Uh, at the target date, they're at least 50%, sometimes 60%, uh, in uh, bonds. And uh, so this general idea is, this is called the glide path of asset allocation or of the fund, and the portfolio is getting safer as you uh, approach retirement. So it's not a crazy plan. Uh, uh, target date funds are, by the way, they're fund of funds, funds of funds. Uh, in other words, Inside them, they have a stock fund and a bond fund and maybe an international fund and other uh, funds. And uh, there's two types of target date funds. One is using uh, the ingredient funds are passively managed index funds, if you like. In other cases, they're actively managed, trying to beat the market type funds. Uh, and uh, 
uh, the fees are much higher for the actively managed ones than for the uh, passively uh, managed ones. I'll say in a minute, uh, which I think is uh, maybe the better way to go. And then I was just gonna tell you about my current research. I'm uh, working on a new type of target date fund. And uh, instead of, so beginning at about age 50, instead of adding bonds to your portfolio and making it safer that way, I uh, am looking into a plan where you would begin to purchase uh, deferred life annuities at age 50. And uh, uh, so you, these deferred life annuities would start payouts at 65 or your date of retirement. And you might make uh, purchases, smallish purchases at 50 and at 52 and at 54 and 56 and 58, 60, 62, and so forth. Uh, so instead of increasing your exposure to bonds, you're increasing your exposure uh, to life annuities and you're buying them on a deferred basis. That is, they don't start paying out uh, immediately. Uh, and when you do retire, you still would have about half of your money in liquid assets, stocks and bonds, and you would, and mutual funds. Uh, but you would have half of your money would be in annuities, providing you a monthly income for the uh, rest of your life. So I'm looking into that as to whether that's a safer uh, way to go. Um, one big advantage of this approach would be that you would be selling stocks and buying annuities maybe seven times. And so you're not so dependent on what the value of the market is on your first sale or your second sale because you're doing it you know, seven times. It's a diversified, diversified strategy. Uh, and so uh, uh, also deferred annuities are priced better than immediate annuities. Uh, why is that? Well, if you buy an immediate annuity, the insurance company assumes that you're healthy. Uh, from their point of view, that's an adverse selection. Uh, but nobody who's in poor health would buy an annuity. But if you buy it at 50, starting to pay out at 65, you don't know whether you'll be healthy or not. So there's not as much adverse selection in this form. Okay, so I was just going to give you some kind of investments advice that I uh, might uh, mention in my class. Uh, it won't be news to you. Stocks are risky. Uh, I don't know if you know how risky they are, but on average, the real return on the stock market uh, is about 7% inflation adjusted, real return, 7%. But in any given year, there's only a two thirds chance that the return will be between minus 13 and plus 27. So there's a one third chance it's gonna be outside those bars. Uh, and so the market as a whole is risky, but individual stocks are riskier still. And one fact that I find interesting is that the uh, S&P 500 has a standard deviation of about 20%. But the average stock in the S&P 500 has a, a standard deviation of 40%. Uh, individual stocks are risky, and they're much riskier than a diversified portfolio, about twice as risky in this case. Um, now, here is something that you may or may not agree with. It's just my opinion. I, my opinion is that essentially no one consistently beats the market. And they also don't time the market well. Uh, it's very difficult to either time the market or beat the market with your portfolio. Even the pros can't do that. Now you may disagree. In fact, that may be your job to try to beat the market. Uh, those that appear to have a good record look to me like they're more likely to be lucky uh, than a good. And that's relevant because the question is, will those who have a good record continue to have a good record? And I'm doubtful. Um, I put here, fees will kill you, particularly saving for retirement because that's a long-term saving plan. And let's say that you have two ways to invest, one that costs you 1.55% per year, and the other costs you 0.05% per year. Well, that so an extra one and a half percent a year, but it is per year. So that extra one and a half percent, you may incur it 20 times, 30 times or more if you're saving for retirement. Uh, in other words, those fees are just going to kill you. Um, how can you pay one and a half, 1.55%? It's very easy. 
Uh, many financial advisors would charge you one uh, percent and put you in a fund that uh, funds that charge you 0.55 percent. So there's your 1.55 percent. How can you invest for five basis point or 0.05 percent? Well, that's also easy. Index funds will offer that. Passively managed ETFs, exchange traded funds will offer that. So it's possible uh, to invest with low fees. It's also possible to invest with high fees. In terms of retirement saving, I think you want the low fees. Um, so uh, I did want to mention that there are tax deferred ways, as you all know, to save for retirement, like IRAs and 401ks and 403bs, which are what nonprofits have. And uh, they uh, all, uh, they're quite similar and they all tax you just once, either when the money goes into the account or when the money comes out of the account. And they don't tax it twice like an ordinary brokerage account does. When you put money in a brokerage account, you have to pay taxes before you put it in. And then as, it, as the assets pay interest or dividends or realized capital gains, you pay taxes a second time. Uh, that's not true for these accounts. Um, so, uh, and of course, you all know that often employers match the employee contribution, sometimes at 50 cents on the dollar. So if you contribute 6%, you end up with a total of nine. So that can be a good uh, deal. Now, here's a tip, but it's probably not for you. It's probably for your children or for Stanford students. But if you're in a, a temporarily low tax rate, such as Stanford students would be, typically Stanford students might be in a 10% tax bracket, might be in a 0% tax bracket or a 12% tax bracket, something like that, really low. Then, boy, if you can put some money in a Roth 401k or a Roth IRA, that is uh, quite attractive. Um, the Roth versions of IRAs or 401ks, you, they only tax you when you put the money in. So if you're at a 0% bracket, you can pay your 0% and that's it for life. When you take the money out, there's no tax. They're the ones that uh, tax you when the money goes in. So when you're in a low bracket temporarily, it's a great time to invest in a Roth. And so here's just another quiz that I would uh, give my students, these are what I call dummy quizzes. And since I'm not really asking you to answer the question, but here I'm just asking uh, if your tax rate is 22% now, but you think it's going to be uh, higher at the time of retirement, 35%, which would be, work better for you, the Roth or the regular account? And uh, by the way, the Roth is the right answer in that case. I just thought I would mention other topics that I uh, talk about in this course, and Michael Boskin does as well. We talk about pretty straightforward things like uh, making a budget, um, uh, credit cards and managing credit cards. They are the exception to low interest rates. As you know, that the uh, typical uh, credit card is, is charging 18 to 20% on money that's rolled over more than one month. One thing I didn't know before I started teaching this course is that credit card companies typically compound that 18 or 20% on a daily basis. It's not compounded monthly or annually, it's daily. Uh, so um, that's an interesting fact to know. Uh, we talk about buying versus renting on houses. Uh, we also talk about the real estate as an investment asset. Uh, we would talk about options and derivatives, uh, calls, uh, puts, uh, futures markets. We, would, uh, we do have a, a lecture on insurance markets, including public insurance, such as unemployment insurance and disability insurance, and also private insurance, such as homeowners insurance or car insurance. We uh, would talk about building a portfolio and this is very important, I think, uh, in the sense that uh, you don't want to take more risk than necessary for whatever uh, expected return you can generate. And uh, so you should think of uh, not of stocks as individual stocks, but uh, how they work 
together in a portfolio. We talk about mutual funds, exchange traded funds, uh, you know, famous financial bubbles, such as the NASDAQ bubble in the late 1990s, or such as the Japanese bubble in the late 1980s. Um, uh, and so, you know, we won't have to be aware of these types of bubbles. Uh, we talk about dividend stock splits. You may have noticed that Amazon is splitting 20 for one, uh, mergers and acquisitions and so forth. Uh, we do talk about Social Security, and we also talk about stock market indices uh, like the Dow and the NASDAQ, which, are, in my opinion, are very flawed uh, because they are stock price indices. They are not stock return indices. They ignore dividends. And in the long run, that's a, a big uh, mistake in the sense that the stock holders do better than these indices do because they get 2%, 3% dividends. And venture capital, private equity. So you can see a little bit on cryptocurrency. So you can see it's a broad ranging course. So uh, Stanford is actually planning a, a big effort in this area of personal finance and financial literacy. They've just received a, a very uh, large donation from Charles Schwab uh, and uh, they're, we're going to try to hire somebody that will uh, take responsibility for this field at Stanford. Um, we are even thinking about uh, exporting courses like this uh, to a broader audiences than just uh, Stanford uh, students. So I want to thank you for participating. For some of you, this may be I get to see you again, because as I said, when you went to Stanford, I was probably here. Uh, I've been here for 49 uh, years. And I can't think of two words better to close with than go Stanford. Thanks, John, for such an illuminating and in-depth presentation. I'm gonna jump into questions uh, from alumni. And the first question we have, what is the, uh, a common mistake couples make in regards to paying for their child's college education? Well, I don't know if there's a, a mistake. I think these, uh, what are they, 529 plans are good plans. Um, so I like those. Uh, um, I think uh, college education, despite the huge price tag, is still a good investment. Um, uh, so I'm not aware of uh, huge mistakes. Um, I do think that uh, you probably want to take at least a modest amount of risk. Uh, that is, the returns on safe assets are zip, zero or negative. And so I do think taking you know, obviously there's a little risk, but I, I would have more of my money in equities uh, than, um, than I could. I'm not as conservative as, uh, as others might be, but I just think uh, there's a huge price to not being willing to take some risk. Maybe you buy safer stock, you know, dividend paying stocks and so forth. Um, but if you're willing to take risk, you're going to get a better average return than if you're not. I have a question from Larry. For a person who's 65 and ready to retire and likely to live another 30 years, shouldn't stock holdings be well above 50% since we're investing for several decades? Uh, for example, how about 70% S&P 500 and 30% traditional annuity offered by TIAA? Uh, I, I tend to agree with that uh, sentiment. Um, you can tell, first of all, 30 years is a long horizon. And I think being prepared to, to live that long is important. No, I, I, I agree with that. And I, and I like the idea of uh, a 30% annuities and 70% uh, index fund. I think that's a reasonable uh, strategy. We were thinking of doing some major renov renovations on our home. From a retirement perspective, perspective, is it better to borrow money or liquidate equity assets? I think this is a tough call. Uh, um, today, I would be tempted to uh, borrow money. You can still get mortgages just at about, maybe just under 4%. Uh, to me, that's still an attractive uh, price for money. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, what I would uh, recommend. We have a question from Lynn. Oh. Go ahead. 
I just want to make sure you're finished. <laughs> I was just going to say that's a tough call, but that's how I would make it. I have a question for Linda. I think the model has changed on retirement. I'm 66 and not planning to retire, but to shift the way, to shift the way I work and generate income, passive income from investments and taking projects I enjoy. I expect to live into my mid 90s and would like to continue traveling and working right up to the end. How would you adjust your calculations for this situation, which arguably is becoming more typical? Well, I think it. it, it uh, by the way, I, I, I think that is right, that uh, many people are going to live a long time and they need to plan that. I think you want to probably be in more equities. This is a strange week or month to say that, given how many risks there are in the market right now. But uh, that's kind of what I would uh, would do. It's interesting. I talked to a, one of my former students and I was talking about uh, retirement and his view of retirement was you're retired when you do what you want to do and you don't have to stop working if you as long as you've got something you do. His view is, hey, Chauvin, you retired a long time ago. You've been doing what you wanted to do for quite a while, <laughs> maybe ever since I was dean of h &S. <laughs> But uh, uh, anyway, th this plan of uh, with the long horizon makes sense to me. I, what I think is many people have too short a horizon. You know, maybe they got used to the fact that their dad died at 78 or whatever, and, and that they're going to be relatively short live, but that's not what the statistics are today. Uh, so I think it's important to have that long horizon. The delay in taking Social Security only works if there is a IS Social Security. How do you assess these political risks? Should we take early... Should we take early to be grandfathered? I don't think so, but I understand the political risk. I uh, honestly, this is just my opinion. I don't think the Congress will cut benefits for current recipients or even for people very near retirement. I think what they're going to do is raise the social security tax, which will affect your children and your grandchildren. Uh, they probably, even though it, it's not legal, they'll, they'll figure out how to make it legal. They're probably, the system is gonna borrow money and they're gonna kick the can down the road. That's kind of how the government behaves. I don't think your benefits are gonna be cut, but I obviously could be wrong. A question from alum. My wife and I are in our early 50s and face paying close to 80000 a year for a Stanford education for our soon-to-be freshmen. They are, uh, they are our only child, so no younger siblings to worry about. Are there any tips we should be thinking about to lessen the impact on our chances to retire? That's a tough one. Uh, um, I presume, you know, as you know, Stanford has financial aid or reduced costs until your income is fairly high, maybe a couple hundred thousand. Um, but, uh, and I think it's a good investment in your child, uh, Stanford in particular, but college in general. Um, well, I don't know of any tips other than uh, you might think of working an extra year or two. Uh, I think there's nothing magic. Um, I'm not, you know, I think some people, uh, almost get carried away with the idea that that retirement is going to be an endless vacation. And somehow I, I think many people in retirement are disappointed that um, they've lost contact with their, their friends and their, their, their coworkers. And, uh, you know, so some people it's marvelous, I'm sure. But uh, I'm not sure that uh, happiness jumps up at the time of retirement. So anyway, I would think of working another year or two. Can you say a little more about the value of the 1% paid to financial advisors if we view it as an insurance policy against big mistakes or neglecting important planning steps? Excuse me. Well, I think some people do need that uh, help. You certainly should shop around uh, for financial advice. I think you can find people that, uh, or organizations that are willing to give you advice for not 1%, but maybe a quarter of 1% or 35 basis, 0.35%. So I think you should chop around. I also think you should be somewhat suspicious of 
uh, someone who says, well, what I'm going to do, I'm charging you 1%, but I'm going to put you in great performing funds. My view is that it's almost as if they're, you're interested in the future, not in the past. And I don't think anybody knows which funds are going to be so great in the future. I don't think funds with a great past necessarily have a great future. Uh, so um, I would think very few financial advisors put you into index funds or passive funds. If they did, I would actually be applaud them. I actually think for long-term savers, uh, being in the market is a good thing. Trying to beat the market is uh, a fool's errand. It's very, very hard. I mean, some people get lucky. But even Warren Buffett, who had a great record until about 2008, he has fallen short of the S&P 500 since then. Here's a question about buying a house. For someone prior to buying a house or real estate, I'm age 30. Uh, the bachelor class of 2012, MBA class of 2019, and one to three years before buying property, how would you weigh out whether to max out the annual 401 contribution or keep that money elsewhere if, I, if it may need to be used towards a down payment? I think buying a house at, at, at your age or within a few years is a great idea. And uh, with your two degrees, I think your income is going to rise a lot by the time you're 45, 40, 45, you're gonna have much higher income. I'd be okay uh, in, um, in not either not participating in your 401k or when the time comes to uh, get your mortgage, uh, taking a withdrawal from your 401k, paying the 10% penalty, particularly if your employer is matching. You know, getting a 50% match and then ultimately paying a 10% penalty is not the end of the world. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is at your age, I would prioritize uh, getting a house relative to retirement. Partly I'm saying that because I think you're going to have some high income years ahead of you where you'll be able to save for retirement uh, big time. Any suggestion for 50 somethings on Roth conversions and when those actions are most advantageous? Sure. Uh, well, actually, Roth conversions are most advantageous when the market's down. Um, and so you have to think, uh, you know, it's hard to know exactly when the market is bottomed, but I would say a Roth conversion today is more attractive than it was a couple of months ago. Um, simply because, let's say you, uh, you know, your Roth had been a million dollars, your uh, account had been a million dollars. And now it's what, 800,000. Well, if you convert, you're gonna pay taxes on 800,000 instead of taxes on a million. So that's good, your taxes, the price of conversion has gone down. So I would say that. The other thing you have to ask yourself is, do you think in retirement, you're gonna be in a higher tax rate or a lower tax rate than you are now? Now, personally, I would guess if you're in your early 50s, so we're talking, let's say in retirement, let's just say, what's your tax rate going to be in 20 years where you'll probably be retired? Boy, I think tax rates are going to be higher in 20 years. So yeah, I think Roth conversion is, 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 is a good thing, but I would wait till I think the market is, uh, you know, it, it's certainly not at its peak. I don't think, a, 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 you know, if you hear the market's hitting new records, that's not the time to uh, do a conversion. If you hear the market's 20% off of its highs, that might be a better time. Any advice on long-term care insurance? Um, we bought it at age 50 almost 20 years ago, but the rates are skyrocketing and the benefits diminishing. You know, for lots of people, it's not such a great uh, uh, purchase. It's so incredibly expensive long-term care that um, almost no matter what you have, it's not enough. Uh, be baby, you're, you're, you're really wealthy and it, it is. But you may know that uh, half of the, at least half of the population in long-term care are on Medicaid. And even people with money, they, they, they spend all their money and then they end up on Medicaid provided long-term care. So I don't know what to say. It, it is incredibly expensive. i give you, a, only a, a thing I can do is reveal, I don't have long-term care insurance. 
Um, now I'm, I'm doing fine financially, so I, I'm probably okay, but uh, I don't have it. Um, so I, I, that's not a very adequate answer, but I understand why it's expensive because <laughs> the uh, care itself is extremely expensive. But many people say you, it, this is probably not your situation, but let me just give you an example. Say somebody uh, needs long-term care and they have no financial assets. Compare that to somebody who needs financial care that has $100,000 in financial assets. They'll get exactly the same care. The 100,000 is just not gonna be enough and they're gonna be end up uh, on Medicaid financed long-term care. They're, they'll get no benefit from having that 100,000. It'll just be sucked up immediately. What happens if Social Security isn't funded in the future? What are the chances of that happening? I think that they're low. Well, I think the Social Security Trust Fund is going to run out of money, and it is going to run out of money in about 10 years. Uh, that sounds scary, but Social Security at that time will have money coming in about three-fourths of what it needs, so that's still scary, 25% short. Uh, you have to ask yourself what's going to happen. Here's what I think is going to happen. I think that of that 25% shortfall, maybe 10% of it will be, uh, 10 points of it will be made up by payroll tax increases that workers will face. So maybe you're retired, so you won't face that, but your children will, your grandchildren will. The other 15 points, I think they're going to borrow the money. Um, I, that's, I'm just an observer of Congress. I, Congress members are not going to go back to their district and say, I cut Social Security 25%. I'm fiscally responsible. They will not get reelected. Here's a question from David. Why would a TIP real return be negative if the security is inflation protected? Wouldn't the lowest return be zero? It's a good question. So let me just tell you how, um, uh, basically how a tips work. Say you buy a 10 year tip and the return offered is minus 1%, which is basically what it is, minus 0.99%. And then let's say there is 5% inflation. Well, you get the minus one plus the five, you get 4% return. You get a positive nominal return. It doesn't match inflation. You've got 5% inflation, you're only getting a 4% return. But those negative numbers, then you have to add on the actual inflation that occurs to get what your nominal return is going to be. Uh, so you are going to, your return, your nominal return is not going to be negative. They're going to adjust those nominal returns by the amount of inflation. Um, so, but it's still, in that example, the tip is offering minus one. There's 5% inflation. They're going to say, okay, 5% inflation, we have to add that to the minus one, we get to four. Uh, so you're going to get a 4% return and 5% inflation, it's still a minus one. Uh, you're, you're guaranteed a minus one. Um, I, it doesn't, it's not very attractive to me um, compared to a stock market, which is very risky, but on average earns about a 7% real return. With a search for yield and uncorrelated assets, there has been a surge of interest in alternative investments, crypto, life settlements, startups, NFTs, wine, et cetera. Can you comment on whether those types of investments are appropriate for someone who is retired? And if so, what portion of your portfolio uh, would you allocate to those types of investments? It's a tough question for me. I have no money in, I have an active portfolio, I have my own portfolio. I have no money in crypto. I have yet to figure out you know, exactly what its uh, role would be. If I were you, I would think about more conventional alternative investments. For instance, I think investing in real estate investment trusts, REITs, is a good thing. So you can invest in cell phone towers. You can invest in uh, office buildings, shopping centers, whatever, apartment, multi-unit apartment complexes uh, through REITs. Uh, or hotels, or, you know, it, it, no, I don't think you should invest in all your money in that, but having some real estate, commercial real estate, through a REIT, that strikes me as better than some of these uh, newer alternatives. I don't know what, I mean, I'm just being honest, I don't know what to make of crypto. 
Uh, when do you expect to have conclusion on whether deferred life annuities is a good strategy? Oh, I hope to have a conclusion within a year of that. Um, by the way, the return on deferred annuities today is low. I mean, they, they tend to follow bonds and bond interest rates. So they fluctuate and right now they're low. Why are they low? Because they're safe. All, almost all safe assets have very low returns today. So low that people are taking risks. People are moving into the stock market. They, you know, they're looking for crypto. They're looking for REITs. They're looking for ways to earn some money because if, you're, um, if you insist on safety, you get, in terms of returns, you get nothing these days. Given the outrageous rise in personal real estate values in most metropolitan areas, have your traditional views of reverse mortgages changed at all? It's such a huge asset. Asset. How how do we best leverage it? I I haven't. I don't have the greatest view on this. I mean, the most informed view on this. I think a reverse mortgage makes a certain amount of sense uh, for somebody in retirement. Uh, they've got, they may have a huge investment in their house. They may uh, want to continue to live in it, but they want to get, get some of their money out. A reverse mortgage, I think makes a, quite a bit of sense. But I must say, I haven't, you know, researched that. So I'm, this is a, uh, only a moderately informed view, but I, I'm sympathetic towards reverse, uh, reverse mortgages. You have a lot of questions coming in. When investing for dividends, the REIT and the MLP companies offer high yields. What are the drawbacks of these assets? And would you recommend these as part of a retirement stock portfolio? And to what extent percentage? I think uh, uh, REITs and MLPs are uh, a good uh, part of your portfolio. Um, they do pay a lot of dividends. They're, they're not. Um, the most tax effective, efficient uh, investment pots around. And some of them like MLP, some of them may involve tax complications like you have to pay more than one state tax return, which can be just kind of a pain. But no, I, I, I do think that they are uh, good. Uh, REITs, I think make a lot of sense. Uh, how, what percentage? I don't know. I wouldn't go above 10% um, total. Uh, on REITs and MLPs, but I think uh, I think there's a case that they should be 10% of your portfolio. Two more questions. Would you clarify again about NASDAQ, et cetera, index funds? Are they worse than people think because of the index funds don't take into account the dividends and splits? No, they're not. Uh, the index funds themselves do include dividends. And so the, a NASDAQ fund or an S&P 500 fund those are fine investments uh, if that's what you want. But what I'm saying is, let's say you are an old guy like me and you actually remember that the uh, Dow was uh, 1,000 in 1965. And you know, to be honest, I don't know exactly where the Dow is today, but let's just say it's... Uh, you know, I may get this completely wrong, but let's say it's 36,000. You would be wrong to think that stocks have returned 36 fold since 1965. You say, wait a minute, it was 1,000, now it's 36,000, it's obviously up 36 fold. It's up a lot more than that, a lot more than that, because the index itself does not take into account dividends. I wouldn't be surprised if the return on the Dow since 1965 is 100x, not 36x. Um, but this is not to indict index funds based on these indices. They're all right. They do include the dividends. Uh, and they will tend to outperform the index. If the index is up, let, let's say the S&P 500 is up 4% for the year, it's quite possible for uh, an S&P index fund to be up five and a half percent for that year. The other one and a half percent are dividends. By the way, you can find total return indices. Uh, the S&P 500 does publish 
a total return index, unlike a price index. But every time you turn on the TV and you turn on CNBC or you turn on Bloomberg, you're getting a price index. It does not include the dividends. You can, have, you can do better than that. And the index funds do better than that. It's just crazy, though, that we publish uh, stock price indices rather than stock return indices, uh, the difference being dividends. And for our last question, is the Econ 43 course available to Stanford alums in any form right now, or are there plans to make it available? So it is not available uh, in any form today. Uh, calling them plans uh, is maybe a little premature, but it's, uh, it's a glimmer. In our, we're, we're thinking about it. It's like you ask a childless couple, are you going to have kids? And they say, well, we don't know. Uh, but they're thinking about it. So we are thinking about whether this course could be extended to Stanford alumni. Uh, if so, it will probably be a couple of years, but uh, we are uh, thinking about it. Uh, I think, I guess I have to admit, we are thinking about it. Well, thank you, John, for sharing your work. I'm planning for your retirement. Good, thank you all. And uh, Tanya, thank you. And, uh, for those of you who overlap with me at Stanford, uh, it's great to see you again.